that's a nice room for a conversation. Um, so as Eleanor said, we've had this great email exchange, which is like, hi Eleanor, 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 Eleanor. Um, there's two days left of this show, and I imagine some of you will have seen it, and some of you won't. Um, so I was going to ask Katie just to start by telling us a bit about that body of work and how it came about. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so the show that I had before that was at Spur and Westwater. Um, and at that time I was getting very interested in still life. And uh, I saw quite a few exhibitions. I was saying to you about the Henry Ploberger painting that I saw. So I was looking at a lot this of... This is in New York. Yeah, in, in, in an yes. exhibition in New York. So I was looking at a lot of um, representational still life, um, but kind of transposing. I find that more and more when I'm looking at paintings, I think this is what all artists do. And I think I've been told that this is why artists like looking at work that isn't similar to theirs because it, then they don't transfer <laughs> their own work onto it. But I, more and more I'm transposing things onto the paintings that I see and I guess it's a more abstracted version or it's a similar kind of mood but... Um, but painted in a different way. Anyway, so I was looking at a lot of representational still life and, and hyper real still life paintings and still thinking about space and colour and uh, surrealism and the landscape because I moved out of London. I lived in London for 15 years and then I, I moved to Hertfordshire and was struck immediately by the light because uh, the light was so different and the spaciousness and the sky and the clouds and I, I've never been inspired by nature or the landscape or the light before so it was quite novel so I guess that was going on at the same time so uh, the paintings in the show reference those things still life landscape um, and uh, there's sort of things like 80s cartoon, there's recurrent themes that have come through again from the show in Spur and Westwater. And, um, and you can't um, necessarily make it out in all of the images here, but it's very apparent when you're visiting the show that the frames are a really critical part of these paintings. And then when you start to look at these painted frames, you realise that underneath are paintings that are not yours. So these are salvaged paintings that you've acquired from eBay. From eBay, yeah. That's a new place now where I get them. Which is good because people take a lot of care on eBay. Uh, I mean, they're generally in a better condition and they wrap them really nicely. and. Anyway, so yeah, I get them from eBay and uh, Amazon. I've started buying them from Amazon. Are you on commission? <laughs> <laughs> and then salvage shops. Uh, but they don't give the same commissions, so you just start <laughs> I should be on commission. <laughs> like in my family, I'm Amazon. <laughs> Mickey's eBay. And my other son, what is he? He's Google. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're the... Things we, yeah. But when we were looking at the show together, I uh, rather naively and maybe a bit uh, rudely referred to them as Sunday painters, just as a kind of, you know, friendly phrase towards amateur painting. And you were quite quick, which I thought was really nice to say, but wait, you know, these are... And, and to think about um, our immediate reaction to kitsch art, because you can sort of see underneath these vestiges of a very different kind of representational still life, and then overlaid all of this kind of energetic colour and mark making, and, and you're kind of curious about the clash between the two, but it, for me that was immediately, I had these kinds of fantasies about Christmas cardy kind of images underneath, and I, I liked your immediate defence of of the paintings that you were working off? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's a good question because um, I'm, I'm not... I, I don't... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like these things. I mean, it's an instinctual response when I pick these things up and think about painting over them, but 
it's that thing I was saying to you about uh, good taste, bad taste, good painting, bad taste, uh, bad painting. Things when taken out of context, you don't quite know where to place it or what to make of it. Uh, I love, you know, high art. I love low art. I love uh, Disney cartoon. I I love a lot of stuff, and so. But I don't even know. As I say, it feels very instinctual when I grab these things. But if I think about what it might mean, there are definitely those things. And this and, idea. Um, also, sorry, this 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 way of painting. So this, like I was saying, um, I made it. I feel like it, I had an option to go two ways in the way I painted and. I picked a different way, and it, it's um, a different type of painting, which is like uh, what I was saying to you about Francis Bacon. So you have paint which conveys by sensation, which means it kind of hits you in the gut, in the solar plexus first, and then it leaks back to the brain. Or a photograph or an illustrational image, you would you your brain would intellectually read it, and then perhaps it would go to your nervous system. And so, most of the paintings are painted in a rudimentary way, or a Sunday paint way that you would. So, in a way, it could be like like I say, transposing or refreshing the energy with this other way. So. Sometimes I'm almost mimicking what might be a figurative thing within the painting, but in a different way. And it's almost like putting them side by side and the different energies. And so, the, yeah, I guess this, but sometimes I love the elements so much I don't want to paint over them. And it's difficult. I normally have to, because it's getting a bit stuck, mm. you know? Yeah. And I think. This idea of the instinctual and the contrived is really fundamental to your practice, always has been, about how much are you trying to kind of release an instinctual energy and how much are you trying to kind of play with that and contest that. And I wondered if you just might talk a little bit about um, the process of mark making for you because it's changed a bit and I, I, just, <laughs> I just love hearing you talk about it. Um, well, I, I guess I've always tried to introduce accident uh, and disrupt the process. And so with some of the earlier works, for example, I would paint them and then I'd dry them on the heater so they'd partially dry and then I'd wash off whatever hadn't dried and keep what had dried. And so for me, it was this way to lose control whilst keeping some control. Or, um, what else would I do? <sighs> or like how long you'd be in the studio for? Being in a particular mode and then not wanting to break with it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know so much. I think that's a different thing. Um, but anyway, what I recently... <laughs> started doing, with about half of the words in here, um, I made the marks using my bomb. So I sat... Which Katie told me about 25 minutes before this, by the way. <laughs> so I sat on them. Uh, and the, yeah. the context in which Katie told me goes like this, which is, I said, oh, by the way, Katie, I was thinking tonight, it'd be really interesting to talk about awkwardness, um, because I've been doing all this work about du buffet and about... Um, the idea of kind of specious notions of beauty, what is the beautiful, what is ugly, you know, we think of Dupuffet and the Orc Pat, and they're really like tough works. And I was reading Amy Silman, and she's brilliant about the idea of awkwardness, and I've got this little quote, and I was like, oh, Katie, I've got this quote, I can read about awkwardness, but just wanted to check, like, do you feel, you know, do you feel comfortable with that in relation to your practice? Does it resonate? And she said, well, you know, never guess what, like, I'm dyspraxic. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's quite interesting. Oh, and by the way, I made half the paintings with my bum, <laughs> so my, like might be relevant. Uh, how? What made you um, start to introduce your bum in your so practice of painting? <laughs> when did that? I think. Uh, so oh, and the pants. The incontinence pants. Yeah. 
So uh, I think one night I was thinking about the brush mark and, and making a big brush mark. And for a while I was interested in the sweep of the brush mark and it being quite obvious and intentional. But I was thinking, how could I make that without the brush, you know, looking at um, body painting, Yves Klein, etc. Yeah, and then the next day I just, uh, it was quite instinctive. I just sat in it with no incontinence pad. <laughs> so I got covered in paint. Um, and I just started sliding on everything I could find, like every surf. <laughs> it was quite, my kids came home and they're like, what did you do today, Mom? I said, well, I sand some paint, wipe my arse on whatever I could find, whatever surface I could find. <laughs> but like, Mom, you're weird. I mean, I'm laughing, but I do also, there's so much about this that I do also think is brilliant. I mean, you know, in terms of the history of paint and the scatological, in terms of also the Eve Klein is like, kind of so that line, line Sorry, that it. was a bottom slide right from one end to the other. <laughs> yeah, that happened on the day I just slid on everything. And Katie also all. said she's been thinking about working with other people's bums. <laughs> I have. Because your own is a bit small. It's small. <laughs> Just so everyone's aware that there are potential job opportunities yeah. for the next show. If anyone would like to volunteer, please see me afterwards. Um, um, but the Eve Klein is quite problematic um, as a project. You know, we see those kind of really glamorous looking pictures of these models pressing themselves, you know, sliding around in the blue paint and then pressing themselves I can up against that the papers. Paint, well, I was going to say, yeah. it's like, it's, you know, it's a much more kind of messy, visceral, Carolee Schneeman-esque bodily response. It's not like Eve Klein's very kind of franche mannered women. It's a nice kind of retort. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason I didn't mention it to you was in a way it's not important mm -hmm. you know it's just another way to make a painting but i suppose it's quite funny mm -hmm. but interesting because it has potential and also this idea of accident and chance because obviously that's why i picked my bomb because you can't see what it's you can't doing look. yeah <laughs> with another body part you could maybe see you could watch. so uh, i think it's also worth winding back a little bit and mentioning your kind of artistic trajectory as it were because I think it's quite interesting to think about getting to a point where physically you want to be divorced from your own vantage point now from having studied illustration and having to do this like really strict regimented illustrative work um maybe you want to talk yeah. about that I mean journey. that was always I kind of put that on myself mm. you know uh my dad taught me to draw from a young age, and so um, I was kind of hell-bent on rendering something, and I thought I knew what the skill was, and I wanted to... Um, I did a lot of reportage and observational drawing and uh, obsessive kind of rendering, and then I remember in the third year of the course, I, I kept wanting to paint, but I was in the graphics department. I kept going and wandering around the fine art department and they discouraged me. They said I'd fail my degree if I <clears throat> started painting, <clears throat> which is hilarious <laughs> now because who cares about the degree? Like no one ever asks you about that. So anyway, I ignored it and I started painting, but there was this moment where I was trying to paint meat and um, something wasn't working and I just kind of, I either had an accident or something happened and I got this slippage in the paint mm. and it was like, wow, it kind of opened up this new world, which is not, it's kind of obvious now, like I was looking at my niece's painting book the other day and it seems so much more free. It, it talks about utilizing accident and it just seems very open in terms of how you can make art and all these different experiments you can do, but it didn't really feel like that to me. So it felt quite radical when this happened and it was like, right, what do I do? Do I exert tighter control or do I go with this? And um, then I read a book by Marion Milner called How Not to Paint. So it started talking about kind of forgetting everything you've learned about what you perceive skill to be and rudimentary training how to draw how to draw from life how to paint from life and 
then more and more in the paintings I would see areas where I couldn't remember making them and they were often the best bits so then that linked to automatism and Francis Bacon uh, and this kind of new way of painting and accessing the unconscious um, yeah and then that's the path I ended up taking I kind of went back and I started making representational paintings of women and that's what I applied to the Royal College of Art with and then it kind of all fell away. Mm. Um, That's interesting that you felt like you needed to go back to a representational mode at the point at which you were seeking admission to another academy. Well, I think when I left my degree, I went back to Manchester and I was making these paintings, but I also signed up for an illustration agency and I paid them a thousand pounds, which is a lot of money then. They never gave me any work. I was really upset. And I did a lot of illustrations, but I was trying to make them in a painterly way. And then I realized that no one cares about illustration. It's like the last kind of thought. Well, that's not true. But when I went to, I went to a lot of newspapers to try and get commissioned to do illustrations and it was badly paid. And it was like the last thought, you know, a kind of afterthought. And so, um, then I moved to London and I had to work so I didn't have much time for painting and I was trying to get into something but I didn't want to go back into academia and then I finally realised that in order to get access to a gallery in London and kind of break into it, um, I had to go and do an MA so I basically quickly made this body of work uh, with portraits of women but I, I don't really know I guess I was painting shoes and women and still representational mm -hmm. but there were areas where things were being ab more abstract but um, and I got a place thankfully but then it was all sort of breaking down and it was funny because I remember the I didn't want to show my work because it was in the middle of something but we had to we had to have an interim show and I put this painting up and the, the head of the course uh, stood next to me and said that that's a beautiful painting and I remember feeling like it's not the one basically I'd started it and the tutor had come round and it was very representational and then it had just fallen away into nothing and he was like it looks like you've fallen asleep here it's kind of you've had a wobble you need to tidy it up so I tidied it up and made it all representational and then the tutor was like you know that's a great painting and I just felt in my court, you know, but that's not, that's not where I was at. But so anyway, it all fell away into a more abstract. But I mean, ironically, I still see them as representational, a lot of them. So, I don't think you it, know, don't it's, think it it's is always on a spectrum, I guess. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So when you started to look at the work of what is sometimes called outsider artists or artists who'd been marginalised from traditional culture, did you find that that was a kind of release? You know, you're talking about this work made from a solar plexus, like you're talking about the difference between, again, that idea of a dichotomy between the intuitive and the contrived, between there you are trying to kind of do this painting that's going to fit with what the Royal Academy expects, which is also kind of to do with what you think a commercial gallery system is going to expect, and then the complete difference to being able to work from your gut, from something instinctual, and that's what can be so thrilling for people when they look at that work for the first time. It's funny because when you say that, I remember a tutor at the college said, when I saw your painting, I thought, you'll get a show with this kind of painting, and now you've gone and... <laughs> 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 just done something completely different, but... Um, I wasn't very well when I was at college. Um, uh, basically, someone spiked my drink just before I started. And um, I was in hospital and uh, I wasn't given any counseling or anything. And basically, a few months after I started getting all these, I guess you'd call them flashbacks, like PTSD. And I was getting like 30 or 40 of them a day. Like it was really bad. But that's, I basically wrote my dissertation on how mental illness mm -hmm. affects creativity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was interesting, just obvious things like when people were in bouts of mental illness, the palette would be very dark. 
and then when they were well again the palette lightened um and i was scrabbling around in the dark like literally in a massive black paint a lot of the time like you say just trying to uh, and so I think in a way, and for many years after, my interest in outsider art was related to this interest in kind of exploring the dark recesses of the mind, mm. you know, like the, uh, the unconscious. Um, and I was interested in... Well, it was around the time that the Museum of Everything was there, and I liked a lot of artists like Augustin Lessage. I don't know if you've heard of him. It's going to be featured in the show this autumn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just loved that story that he was a, a miner. He'd never lifted a paintbrush in his life, and then the, the spirit spirits. voices said to him, you've got to, you've got to start painting. <laughs> He's, they said something like, he said, but I've never even picked up a paintbrush. And they said, don't worry about insignificant detail. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the paint. And then, but when you, what, so we did, and when you look at those paintings, they look like a computer made them. I mean, it is extraordinary. Like, For anyone who hasn't seen them, the largest of them are about four metres by four metres across. I mean, they are enormous and they're made of single pin prick marks pretty much. And they're mostly in geometric patterns. Later, they get kind of a little bit psychedelic and he starts to introduce um, some very religious elements as well. You know, these are spiritual mediumistic paintings, but just technically, if you're just looking at them as artworks, they are extraordinary accomplishments. So the idea that this person suddenly felt compelled to make them. But it really feels like he's a conduit, mm. you know, something's just coming through him. But so, yeah, I was interested in that kind of thing where I'm not so much now because I'm not, well, it's still about the mind, but the healthy mind, I mm. think. Um, Which brings me to the question of colour. Yeah. There was a lot of very neutral tones in your yeah. work previously, and yeah. as you can see in some of these, they're very vivid. Is it Hertfordshire? Um, definitely Hertfordshire, but also a conscious decision, I think. Um, I think sometimes I think about going against my natural tendencies, and my default setting is a neutral palette, maybe because I grew up in Manchester. <laughs> And it's very grey and rainy. Uh, so I was trying to use colour and be intentional about that. But also with colour then comes space. And often mine are very busy and full, the, you know, the painting. So I was, yeah, thinking about both colour and space and intentionally trying to use clean areas of colour. And this is, you said, the first time that you've made a body of work where you've been consciously thinking about the space that they go into. And as a curator, this is always super interesting. Kind of, there are some artists who make work and they're so absorbed in the midst of that picture plane that kind of what's gonna become of it afterwards is neither here nor there. And there are other artists for whom they're thinking, this is gonna sit on that left-hand wall and it's gonna catch the light at 4 p.m. And you know, they have a different vision. And so how does that yeah, affect? When I was interested in outsider art, I suppose I thought that it would be contrived to think about a space. And I thought very much about the trajectory of, um, of my career as an artist and that I didn't want it to be interrupted by exhibitions and mm -hmm. that I should just make the work that I was destined to make and I wouldn't plan for a show, I'd just show whatever I'd made because it was about this relationship. Um, but again, I, I, I'm not looking so much at outsider art now and I feel I like to <laughs> focus on mental wellness um, and optimism. And uh, so I don't think that it's, I suppose I used to be, I didn't want to think about an audience, mm. you know, about the viewer, uh, these kind of things. But, but it's interesting because now... these ideas about authenticity can be contrived in themselves. Well, yeah, I mean, it's only looking back that I re re remember that I felt like that. Yeah. But I mean, you're it's right. Like, yeah. 
It's yeah. certainly the point that Dubuffet reached, that he was, at the beginning of when he's founding the collection de Labrie, he has these like really kind of romantic notions. He says, this is work made by those, um, it's always a bit weird to kind of translate, but he basically says, unscathed by artistic culture and he's interested in people who just like you were saying you expected of yourself would work feverishly and compulsively and with no mind to the commercial sale of the work with no mind to the exhibition no need for it to be applauded or for accolades they just were completely self-engined and then at a certain point he realizes that even certain artists who were working within the most remote asylums were expecting the recognition of their fellow patients, you know, and, and took something from the attention that they received from their doctors, from the doctors having correspondences with curators or writers or other people. So some of this is also human instinct. And he reached a point of kind of saying, maybe I need to go back on some of these ideas of authenticity. No, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it is about communication. And even if people aren't well, I think there's maybe still an innate human need to connect and communicate. But maybe it's more that as you get more and more mentally well, you can rejoin this world. Mm. Whereas when you're not well, you're, you're out of this world, you're, you're, you're somewhere else. You're even either making another world for yourself or you feel very out of kilter with this world. But I'm interested in that as well. It's like, um, I don't know, it just makes me think of Hilma Clint. Um, I love that as a woman, she wasn't getting the recognition or control in this life. So her and her female friends and artists decided to contact another life, <laughs> another world, the afterlife. I just love that. Uh, no, she's a remarkable figure and I think it's like in exhibition making terms one of the most exciting moments for me to see Hilma Afklint, a Swedish turn of the century spiritualist, one of the most popular shows that the Guggenheim has ever staged. I mean, that is a breakthrough in exhibition making. Um, but I, this idea of how you challenge yourself, I think for a lot of the artists that I spend time with, this is so much of what they grapple with in the studio. How and, and for many of us actually who have other kinds of practice, be it writing or other things, this idea of how much should I be going with an intuitive sense of what the next direction is for me? And how much does that lead to me working within spaces of comfort? How much do I deliberately need to put obstacles in my way, force myself in different directions? And how much is that, um, you know, how much discomfort is healthy within an artistic diet? I, I don't like the word discomfort. Mm. I don't know. Like, I, I try and make it as enjoyable and comfortable and exciting and a process mm. possible now. I really so try. some of the challenge or change of colour is also about keeping that stimulation. Oh, God, yeah, definitely. It's keeping it interesting for myself and a challenge and trying to find something new and interest and excite myself. But I feel like maybe in, in the past I felt like I wanted to tap into the unconscious in preference to consciousness and intentional marks. Whereas now I just feel like use it all, just mm. utilize it all, you know, take from everywhere. Mm. And this, you know, and that just comes with experimentation. Mm. And, and then sometimes you don't even know where some of it's come from. But yeah, I think it is instinctive. And maybe also reaching a point where you're more comfortable with your own practice as well, I think. You start, it starts to become easier to assimilate in these moments of change and feel kind of excited by those new developments rather than kind of nervous about where it will go or take you. I've always welcomed change. Mm. I like it when there's a shift because mm. it means something's fresh, mm. something's shifted. I quite like that. But it's interesting how far you've come. I mean, in, in terms of things like, I found it really interesting when you were where you have written in the past about working on these much larger canvases and then sometimes cutting them down into smaller pieces, kind of zoning in on particular areas you really liked. Moving from that to working within a set 
parameter? I, supp I suppose I like being, being alert to the painting could happen in any moment. Um, and that's what happens when you don't plan what you're going to paint. It could happen at any time. And so in that way, if you're working on a large work, there's a plethora of opportunities. Mm. Um, but all of your work but, is... Yeah. Sorry, just to say, then there's a time to just, I felt, to commit to something. Yeah. You know, I am going to make it work within this border, and I'm going to stick to that. And giving yourself that restriction and knowing you can't have the flexibility of using a window finder or kind of zoning in on a different bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not even seeing yeah. it, let alone having a window finder. What do you mean? Sorry. Well, if you're using your bum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she forgets so quickly. That's what's kind of amazing about it. Yeah. But that it also means there's an intimacy to that scale. I think for viewers who go into that space, you know, we think of these, like, you know, the grand gestures of American abstraction, say, and, and part of the idea of that painting is that it should be vertiginous. You know, you should look at it and feel like you're kind of drunk on paint. Whereas when the painting is smaller, we're able to kind of digest the whole picture plane. We can kind of absorb it in one view, but it also means it's closer to our own body, our own physicality. Yeah, I think for me, I just feel that the paintings operate at a certain distance. And when they're a certain scale, they operate well at that distance. Um, and I guess it's the sense of illusion that I'm trying to achieve which is basically the representational image that I'm trying to achieve, which is strange because mm. they're considered abstract, but um, I think that's what it is well, for me. abstraction is a very but subjective the, term. This, yeah, but the, yeah, this kind of illusion works best for me at this scale. How much do you think about us, the people in this room when you're working? How much do you think about viewers? Uh, it's funny because I've always found that a little strange, yeah. this idea of what the viewer, because who is the viewer, obviously every viewer is different, but there have definitely been times I've been thinking about the viewer, there was times where I really had an idea and I wanted to make it more representational because I really wanted the viewer to see the thing in that painting because it meant something to me. But then I find that it actually got in the way of the painting and the painting was getting a little stale because it was pushing too hard to, you know, show this, this, uh, this narrative or this um, representational image. And so I still experiment with that, but it's being mindful of the energy and how the energy of the painting is. What did you ask me again? About the viewers. About okay. us. See, the look viewers, how quickly yeah, you forget us. <laughs> like, mm. No, because when I made this show as well, uh, the most recent show, I, I did think about the viewer. It, it feels a little bit embarrassing, but I guess I had a, a moment where I realised that not everyone feels about painting the same way that I do or that painters do. And so anyone who's putting on a painting show in a way is championing, championing a painting. And uh, I kind of tried to cultivate this state in myself where I could be really, really inspired by other people's paintings. I mean, I am obviously anyway, but uh, to the point that I was saying to you where I'd like go around the Tate and look at work and just feel like literally like high high on these works and then it felt like my works were a response to the intense feeling that they gave me this power and that if they were about anything then they could be about this kind of question don't you feel it as well you know don't you feel it to this kind of intensity of feeling and in that way optimistic and life affirming and I was thinking about this as in like this kind of nihilist idea of life being meaningless and pointless and then if you have intensity of feeling then that somehow <sighs> it's gonna make me a bit upset <laughs> makes it worthwhile and yeah. um, I suppose that in a way is what gets you 
you know, what keeps you painting? Because otherwise, why would you? So no, it's, it's really, it's really nice to see your response to it because I think, um, you know, most, the shows that I've done have all been painting at the Barbican actually, and that's not because I'm not interested in other media. It's because actually it feels like the thing that's most urgent for me at the moment. Like that's my the word urgency. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's urgent. And then yeah. my brief for myself at the Barbican is that I want to make it a space that's a bastion. That was my idea. Let's take this brutalism and let's make this concrete. Instead of feeling alienated and like people are kind of shut out from this, let's make it feel like a place that's safe. You can't get Wi-Fi. So, <laughs> um, you know, make this a space in which you're switched off and you're communing with other people and... That to put painting in those spaces might both be materially quite interesting, but also might act as a tonic for people. That um, and and that was the thing that was particularly remarkable to see with the Krasner show because I was, you know, it's one thing to do it with the Basquiat show, right? You kind of know you're preaching to the choir, but um, but with Krasner it was really interesting because it was like, well, here's a painter who whose name is basically completely unknown. And abstraction remains something that for lots of people is very alienating and quite daunting. You know, I don't necessarily have the art historical expertise or um, the visual language to feel competent in this space. And we did some very simple gestures that we built 12 new benches to go in the space to invite people to actually sit down with these paintings. And it was amazing. Every day there were people in tears, which was Krasner, not me. <laughs> but uh, but painting does have that capacity. So does a bench. So does a bench. <laughs> so does a bench. I love a bench. Preach. <laughs> My God. <laughs> Especially 1,500 square metres in the Barbican. When you... I oh know, this is actually the secret to my curatorial success. <laughs> it's a good one. Simple but effective. Okay, so we're going to ask some questions of everyone else in a minute. Um, but I, I did just want to ask you, really um, for myself as much as everyone else here, um, it's a kind of raging debate when we stage exhibitions of um, historic artists, artists who are no longer alive, when we have to take certain decisions on their behalf. How much should we talk about their life? What's the place of biography in relation to an artist? And how much does that actually take away from our just appreciating them as a painter ind independently? And as curators, we try and make you know fair judgments about this. Let's give a context. Let's not be salacious. Um, but I think it's particularly important to ask women artists because it tends to be, not always, but it tends to be when we do exhibitions of women artists, we tend to give about 20 to 30% more biographical content than we would if it was an equivalent male artist. And a like, perfect example of that would be the comparison between the Picasso 1932 show, lots of biographical info, but definitely not two rooms dedicated to Dora Maul. Dora Maul show, <laughs> a little bit different. So I just think it's kind of interesting to hear from living practitioners about what they feel in terms of how their work is staged. You know, do you, are you open to there being some of that context around your work or do you like it to be talked about separately? Uh, so when you say biography, you mean? Everything, your, what happens in your life and how that intersects with the life that you have in the studio. I suppose my first thought is when I see someone has been given more of a biographical uh, content in their show, it means that they're more of an elevated figure somehow. Mm. That's how I start to feel because it's no longer just about the work. People are fascinated by every it's aspect of their life. Yeah. Um, That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah, and uh, I love to know the details about artists' life and everything around the art. Like, it's like gold dust to me. <laughs> it's, you know, it's fascinating. But almost separate to viewing the art, because mm. it can get in the way. Mm. Sometimes you just want to see the art, and then in some other parallel universe, you'll kind of read <laughs> about it or Speak to the spirits, get them. <laughs> yeah. It's like two very separate things, I find. But... Um, 
do you, do you so improve thing. things like your press release before it goes out? Are you conscious about how language is used around your work? You have very um, deliberate titling of the work. Yeah, which more and more is like an aid to me now to remember, like just this one now is called DC2, which stands for Dirty Clean, because my aim at that time was to get clean areas of pain. Mm. But I wouldn't necessarily remember that unless it was in the title. So more and more it's like an aid. Uh, but yeah, no, I guess it is important, um, the wording in a press release. Uh, we changed the press release several times, I think. <laughs> <didn't we? laughs> I know, as yeah. I asked that, I thought, well, then I might not agree. <laughs> not, not a crazy <laughs> amount, but maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a healthy number of rounds of proofs. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that artists have very different levels of attachment to these things. Yeah, I guess. I guess it is. But it feels like a very specific thing. Mm. So you'd want to be specific about the words that you use, I guess. Okay, so maybe we should see if anyone has any questions for you. Oh, great. Do you want to start here? Just speak up so people can hear. Yeah. No, that's a really good question because uh, um, the question was about some. There's a series of works in this show and the other show in New York at Spur and Westwater called um, Magritte Mornings, and it became a bit of a recurrent theme. So um, when I was saying I was influenced more by the landscape, um, in the winter I was cycling at about half six, seven in the morning, you get this light, uh, which reminded me of the Emperor of Light series by Magritte, where you have the blue sky, which looks like day, and the, you know, the ground is night. And it literally was like that. And then um, it kind of made its way into my paintings, this kind of very dark, midnight blue black against this pale blue have been very in influenced by the sky i think but also this yellow as well so this kind of winter light but it was interesting to find that magritte was influenced by a victorian artist you know john Atkin atkinson grimshaw who used to paint um night paintings nocturnal scenes and he you know in the victorian area era so I found it quite comforting that, you know, it's like 200 years on, but we're still having these, you know, in the digital uh, advancement, etc., that actually we're still the same in many ways, that we're still responding to the landscape and nature and simple things. And I like that kind of lineage. So then a lot of the works kind of features this light or this kind of flora fauna, for want of a better word, this kind of representational moths, butterflies, nature, light, landscape, all the, yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah. No, it's a good question. I definitely, it definitely sometimes becomes part of the painting because obviously it gets paint all over it. And then often it's a helpful tool whilst I'm in the process of painting because I can then redefine the edges as I'm going along. And then it, I guess it takes it back outside the painting and makes it you know, a frame is a traditional convention. And so because I don't know what I'm going to paint and I want this element of surprise, a convention like that helps me sometimes to recognise the image more quickly. Like sometimes I'll put them next to a plant or when I was working at home, I put them on the sofa 
to help me recognize them uh, more quickly because obviously it takes time to know whether it's worked or not and I, I get impatient I want to speed that up. It's funny because with the frame everyone associates it with Howard Hodgkin not that he's the only one who did it but I was watching something about him and apparently he um, he had frames to protect his subjects because although he was an abstract painter, it was figurative to him. There were people in them and, and this, this framing was a protection of them, which I thought was interesting. But I guess it's also control, which I could be guilty of. Because <laughs> there was one time I got a painting back for a museum show and it came, someone had framed it, the person who bought it after the fact, and I didn't like the frame at all. And uh, we asked if we could take it out of the frame. So I guess there's that kind of thing. But then uh, often the things I'm interested in just happen to be in frames. Like there was a painting in the show that wasn't in a frame and, and it, it's fine, I can do that, but I guess... I do like the aesthetic and what it speaks of, and art history, low art, you know, yeah. Um, I, I'm really interested in the trigger point in how you paint. So, you know, like the way that Suzy would get paintings at the flea market so that you had something to work on. And I always thought that your paintings, I, I, I thought of them in that kind but in, yeah. in the recent show, you've left quite a lot of bits of the found pictures, and it creates a different kind of pocket. But it also means something different for me. And I, I wanted to know a bit more about that. I mean, when you say that about Satine, was it? I don't know if this is what you mean, but I think one of the reasons I paint over things is because it gets me to a place of interest very quickly you know, like a ready-made or using collage or whatever. Is that what you meant? Yeah, and then know, when, I, when I used to put colours on these canvases, so that then you had something to respond to. Yeah, so I, yeah. I always thought that your paintings, by using the found paintings, that you were activating a sort of trigger, like, in the same way. But what I was surprised about in this show was that yeah. there was another thing going on that meant something. Like, what do you mean? Well, you know, like the house that you can see through the paint. Yeah. Well, you, you talked about um, the way that your brain works when you see a representational image and the kind of Bacon-esque idea of reading it. And there were some very literal bits poking through that yeah. I was reading. I didn't see that house. <laughs> I do, I do. I mean, I saw it afterwards. But I, I made the painting once, and then at the end I saw it cannabis, the word cannabis in it. And I hadn't had any cannabis, but I couldn't, I didn't even know there was this word there. So I think I'm in a haze. But it's also interesting because you see in that one where that little pocket's revealed, you see that it's been rotated. So it's not just that you're seeing the imagery, you're seeing that the imagery isn't in its original orientation. So you're getting this sense of an object that's already got an inherent sense of movement to it. Yeah. But I'm definitely seeing something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pages. Pages. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That's a really good question because um, I've been reading a I was lot. I say, about look, that, you can talk about <laughs> daily rituals. This is um, Katie's reading pile that she brought. <laughs> um, so, for the past sort of year or so, I've been thinking exactly about. Uh, creativity and where you put your energy and what's the most advantageous way to work um, and I guess I already was in a pattern but I wanted to validate it or know more about the creative process and um, a lot of these books say basically a lot of figures throughout history 
worked a lot less than we do now. They worked for this this thing about four hours, four hour working period. And this other book I read by Cal Newport called Deep Work, and it's in basically like telling us that we need to protect our ability to go deep because now the way the world is is all about shallow focus with emails, constant distractions, and this ability to go deep um, will be highly prized in the future. And so the book is talking about how you protect that and how you are able to do it. So these books have kind of validated what I thought, but and they also talk about the way that um, writers, artists, athletes, all these different people work and uh, Cal Newport talks about these different philosophies and this like this bimodal philosophy, a rhythmic philosophy, a journalistic philosophy and that's how people work and some people like Jung for example would lock himself away in a tower, he built a tower and would lock himself away for months at a time to go into his deep work and then maybe part of the year he would be running his clinic or whatever. So that would be bimodal. And then rhythmic is where you go in every day and it's like repetitive. And journalistic is you grab it where you can because journalists often have to work to a deadline. But I'm somewhere between bimodal and rhythmic, I'd say, where I have a very set routine, like I want to start at 10. And I normally work for four hours, sometimes five, sometimes six, but I've been trying to cultivate this four hour period where I don't sit down, I don't look at my phone, I make my drinks before I get to the studio and I have this four hours of just like constant intense work ideas just coming and then I go home and that's it. So, but it's very important that I, I don't like not starting at 10. I mean, nothing's gonna get in my way. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, but that rhythmic thing of you know the accumulation, I think is really important. When you're in it, you're in it. And I'm gonna say that some of the rituals in this book should not be adopted without a doctor's supervision. <laughs> yeah. Quite dangerous. I know, they're yeah. crazy. 24 cigarettes before you start on a painting. I know, but it's I get... the lighter end of the book. <laughs> it is, it's crazy, but it just shows how creative people are so attached. When we could be so free without schedules, we're so attached to our daily rituals and setting up the conditions to get into the states needed to make the work. Uh, and that's what this book, Deep Work, is saying. For people who consistently have to go deep to do hard work day in, day out, you have to cultivate it. It's really interesting. So we've probably got time for one last question, if anyone has a burning question. Otherwise, I think it leaves me to thank Katie, to encourage you all to think about applications both for um, daily ritual advice and also to line up for possibilities of becoming bum models in, in future series of paintings. Thank you very much, Katie.